I have a new knife I want to share with you today, and this is something I'm really very excited about. This is the Forester from Work Tough Gear. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this knife, keep watching. All right, just before we get started, I want to thank first Alex from Aurora Burialis Knives for sending me this so that I could test it out and provide some feedback to him. And of course, Vic at Work Tough Gear for making these knives. So why am I so excited about this design? Well, this is a purpose-built bushcraft knife. Vic, or excuse me, Alex took all the things that all of us want in a bushcraft knife, put them into this knife, but used modern materials to make it. And he really did succeed. I didn't even, you know, it took me a while to really figure out all the different things that are in this knife that make it so good for doing bushcraft. And I'll, of course, demonstrate all those two in a moment. So just before I give you some close-ups and go over the specifications for it, I just want to talk to Work Tough Gear for a moment. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Work Tough Gear knives by now. I've reviewed a few other designs by uh, one, well, of course, Alex, the Wolverine and the Kodiak, and I I have links to those that will be at the end of this video. This is the third knife designed by Alex, and if, of course if you're not aware, Aurora Borealis Knives is based out of Quebec, Canada, so I like that idea of reviewing somebody who is in Canada making knives that are suited to the Canadian environment. Vic is located in Taiwan. Now, before people uh, judge that these are offshore, cheap, Chinese-made knives, they're not. They're anything but. First off, they do cost a little bit more than a lot of knives, and there's a reason for that. First off, you're paying for the designs, in part, you're paying for the designs of these custom knife makers who put their effort into first designing these knives. And then when it goes over to Vic to produce these knives, it's not a high production factory. It's a small family-owned business, and it's referred to as mid-tech. There is some production in some of it, but the final finishing is all done by hand. So, and you can tell. When you hold these knives and you look them over, you cannot find a flaw in them because they are actually put together by people and not machines. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, let's close in on this knife a little bit. I'll go over its key features and its specifications while we take a closer look. All right, I thought I'd start by showing you what the knife looks like in the sheath. I'll give you a few close-ups of the sheath, talk about it for a second, and then of course we'll go on to the knife. So the sheath is a black leather, and it's actually a very heavy, I don't know how many ounce it is, but you can see just how thick a leather it is. It is a simple drop pouch design and with a dedicated dangler on it with re removable belt loot. Uh, yeah, it, and actually it rides perfectly on my hip as well. Very well put together, nice thick welt down the outside of it, burnished properly. When I got it, and it was one of the first comments I made back to Alex, is, I, holy smokes, that sheath is tight. I may end up having to wet form it. I'm not sure I'm going to now because over time it is starting to take the shape of the knife, but I can tell you when I first got it, it was work getting the knife in and out. And actually, it's still quite a bit of work. I think it's better than have had to have it a bit too tight than, of course, to have it a bit too loose. So, yeah, really nice sheath. If there was anything I would like to change about it, well, two things. One is I, it's not a deal breaker, and neither of these are deal breakers, but I ask Alex about the addition of a ferrocerium rod loop here, whether the rod is included or not. That's in discussions with Vic at Work Tough Gear. But the other thing that for me is the belt loop. Now, dome snaps. Uh, the theory, of course, is that you can take it on and off of your belt without having to take your belt out of the belt loops on your pants. Makes it easy if you want to do that when you get to the woods as opposed to putting it on beforehand. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I would like I would prefer just a small modification to it that this be extended not even a half inch, maybe a quarter of an inch, so that it can be pinched right here and then sewn across so that it becomes more fixed to the loop itself. Now, you're saying, Mark, why would you even want that? Well, here's what I find, and it's not a big issue, but when I reach down to my side and I grab onto the knife, the whole thing wants to ride up the sheath like that. Now, I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but that's what it would do. I find that when the the belt loop is so enclosed here, then of course it, it can't come up the full loop. So just a little bit more of, uh, I guess, ease of use over time. Deal breaker? Hardly. I, I'm actually very happy with this. It still takes me two hands to get the knife out of the sheath in any case, like this, as you'll see. It's quite, quite snug. All right, we're all about doing some close-ups for it. 
first a few close-up, then we'll go over the specifications. So, the Aurora Borealis, uh, marker, maker's mark here, VIX Worktoff maker's mark on the other side. Now, I am using my phone for this because, uh, yeah, I left my written instructions at home or my written information at home, so I'm going to be looking down to my phone a little. All right, let's do the overall length, go through the specifications. Overall length from pommel to tip, 8.75 inches, and of course all this information will be in the video description. Blade length, 4 and 1 8 inches. Blade height, 1 and 1 8 inches. This is exciting. Blade thickness, 1 8 of an inch. Weight for this knife is 8 ounces. Weight with the sheath is 12.8 ounces. Now here's where things get exciting. Steel is Bowler K340. So what is Bowler K340. I had to look it up. I'll put the link to where I found the information on it in the video description if you're interested. But basically, it's an improved uh, D2. Like Slepner, maybe even better. Better edge holding, better or ease of sharpening. Still, still semi-stainless. So it does not have enough chromium to be classified as a stainless steel, but it is more stainless than a true carbon steel knife is. I'm saying that because, of course, well, you would anyway with any knife, regardless if it's stainless steel or carbon. You still have to take care of it. You still have to make sure that it's dry. It's nice to put a coating of some type on it when you put it away so it doesn't rust, but it is in terms of performance, an excellent, excellent choice for this style of knife. That's one of the modern materials that Alex put into it. And Vic at Work Tough Gears knows how to get the most out of his heat treat with this steel. He's been using it for quite a while. Handle material is a green and black layered G10. You could be given, forgiven for thinking it is my Carter, but it is G10, very, very attractive. I'm hoping this will show up on it. I'm trying to catch it in the light. It's got a cross-cut checkering, so it's dimpled all the way along from the cross-cut checkering, and that is all over the knife. I thought at first it was going to be a little rough, a little aggressive, but it's just the opposite. Because it is so well-rounded here, none of that texturing comes in contact with the web of your hand or the fingers itself, only the palm, and that's where you want it. That's where the traction is, is along the palm as you grab this knife. Um, let's take a look at the handle. It is minimal in terms of its sculpting and palm swells. There is a palm swell, minimal here. Deeper here, but not by a whole lot, but it flares both at the top of the blade and down by the pommel. Look how little of a choil there is on either side with that guard. Just minimal. That is true bushcraft design. What this allows for, oh, let's just finish it off first and then I'll, I'll talk more to it. Rounded pommel, nicely rounded pommel. Recessed, sometimes referred to as hidden uh, lanyard hole down here. Just And of course my trademark, I guess, small piece of green paracord because colors like that, if I drop that, I'm, I'm definitely going to have trouble finding it. So I just want to make sure I have something that I can see. Okay, a few thoughts on the handle itself. You would think, Mike, I would be complaining about the thinness through here. That was going to be my first thought when I saw this. I said, that's, that's like all the other knives I try. My XL hand is not going to work with this. But look how deep it is here. That is what makes all the difference. This knife works perfectly with my XL hand. In fact, it's so much of a pleasure to hold on to. Would I like it a little thicker through here? Maybe, but I don't feel like I'm deprived of anything with the thickness through here. Those minimal guards mean that it is so comfortable when you turn it around in your hands, you forget that you're not holding a true puko. It feels like a puko in the hand, but here's what's better, even better than a true puko. The high sides being at relatively flat here allow for control that you can't get with a lot of other knives. It is that ratio of width to depth that gives you a lot of control when you're turning the blade. It won't uh, work against you. A totally round blade, some of the what's referred to as broom handle style blades, um, they'll turn in your hand or try to and you have to hold on to them extra tight. Less so with this. It just works so nicely. 
there are no thumb scallops and it's not chamfered here at the edge. That might be one small thing for me. I do like thumb scallops, but I, I can live with this and maybe just take a little chamfer off and you're asking why? Because when I hold it in reverse grip, I do like to put my thumb up here and I like it to be comfortable. That, that's where I get a lot of, of control when I'm doing chest lever cuts or anything that requires me to work the knife like this. Still, it's not a deal breaker. It's anything but. It's working very, very nicely for me. I can't tell you how many different things that I've picked up with this knife over the design of it. One eighth inch steel. I know a lot of people will question that because there has been a move towards thicker steels like, uh, you know, five eighths and, and, and so on. You know, not five eighths, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, three sixteenths, thicker steels. And Yes, if you're using this knife as a survival knife, then you may want thicker steel. But for a bushcraft knife, you don't. You want the thinnest steel you can get away with that is still strong enough for the tasks of, say, batoning. And one-eighth is, to me, is that sweet spot. Could go a little thinner, but this is going to give me the confidence at one-eighth that I can baton with this. Plus, the height of the blade. Look at this, the height of the blade. It is a drop point design. It's not a true spear point. The tip of the blade is not truly in line with the center line of the knife itself. A lot of people look for that in a bushcraft knife because they, they claim it makes it easier for drilling, say bull dual divots or any drilling at all. I don't know that I totally agree with that. I understand the theory behind that. But for me, having a, a drop point that comes all the way down to a spear point takes away usually some of the belly. So what we have here is we still have quite a bit of curve up towards the tip. Look how strong that tip is. I cannot imagine, no matter how hard you jam this into wood, that you're going to be able to break that tip off. I'm not going to try it and find out, of course, because that's not what a bushcraft knife is for. However, you do do some stabbing into wood when you're doing crafts with this and you're doing some drilling with this, so you want to know that it does have a strong tip for those types of tasks, and it does. Very, very, very strong. Grind. Scandinavian grind knife. Has to be, of course, for a bushcraft knife, right? But we know from experience that a true zero grind, a true Scandinavian grind without any type of secondary can be very weak at the edge and quite, it takes a lot of sharpening to keep it strong because there's so little metal. When Alex told me that this had a micro edge on it, a convex micro edge, and then I received the knife, can you see it? There's a little glint just off of the edge of the blade. That's how micro edge this is. So it does it have a secondary edge on it? Yes, it does, but it is a micro convex, the strongest you're going to get that does not impair the carving ability of the Scandinavian type of grime. Okay, do I sound excited? Well, I am very much excited, but let me demonstrate this knife for you so you can see it in action. All right, in order to keep this video at a reasonable length, I'm just going to do a few tasks that I would normally do with a bushcraft knife. This is not going to be everything that you would do, of course, just a few. So one of the things, of course, that we expect of bushcraft knives or any of the knives that we use in the wood is to be able to make a fire with it. So that usually involves wood processing of some type and with some batoning. So I did cut a piece of hardwood I am not sure. I'm not going to know until I get it open. I believe it's maple, but it could be oak. It's just, it was just a piece of dead standing. You can see the bark is coming off. Hopefully it's not too old and punky in the inside that I can't do anything with it. And I just found a huge knot on it. So, okay, that's more than a reasonable test for this, I would think. I'm actually going to drive this right down. No, I won't. I'll drive. Yes, I will. Drive it right down through the knot. I have been doing this and without any issues at all. So let's see. Yep. Kind of skirted the knot a little bit, but uh, maple. That's what we have. We have maple. I love maple. I'm going to cut this into four pieces so that I can use them for different demonstrations. Yeah, I didn't expect any, and I, I have been using this for a period of time now. 
zero, zero effect on the edge of the blade. Okay, let's move on to the next demonstration. Okay, I just went through the uh, splits that I have just to see which one I wanted to save for feather sticking. Picked the worst of the four of the moats for this demonstration, which is just going to be simple notching. All I'm doing now is demonstrating how I would do cross batoning, which can be very hard on the edge of the knife, depending on the wood, of course, and the knife itself. Just a little cross batoning so that I can make a notch as if I was making a tent peg. All right, that's plenty deep for a tent peg. Little stop cut right here. Clean, very nice. Now, this is just one of many, many types of notches or uh, other little uh, things you can do with a piece of wood that uh, will involve cross batoning or working with the knife on its edge. And I only use this one as representative of all the different ones you can do. Of course, if I want to finish this tent peg off, I got to put a point on the other end of it. So, of course, there are different ways of, that you can put a point on the end of the stick. Uh, the one I like to do for this type of operation is chest lever cut, and I think it does a better job of demonstrating how comfortable the knife is to hold in this position. So grabbing the knife, pinning my hands into my chest, I just reach up and, wow, that is just pulling material off of the stick in a big, way that scandy eye scandy grind just bites in and that would be done so i would say that's enough of a point to create a tent peg out of this all right next demonstration feather sticking so once again, I am using maple, which is a great wood, and as long as the grain is straight, it should feather pretty good. This is some nice straight grain maple, and it appears to be in good shape, so let's see if we can't create some feathers with it. So I have been practicing with this knife now. Oh, this is the third time in the woods. We'll speak to that in a moment, but uh, I've gotten used to what it can do very, very quickly, and uh, yeah, it being a scandy grind, even with that micro bevel, it can really bite in. So you do have to, how should I say, be cautious or just be conscious of how deep you start your curls. Get used to the angle of it. I won't do a lot of feathering, I'm losing a few of them here, but that's my fault, not the knife. Losing as many as I'm keeping, actually. Vary my angle a little bit. Some bigger ones. If wood is old and not in the best of shape, I find that that's when you have trouble keeping your feathers on, as well, of course, as making them too thin. There is such a thing. Let's move over to the outside edge. So with a lot of knives, if this is where my hand starts to get tired, is because I'm holding onto the knife and if the grip is not big enough, I find myself holding tighter and tighter to maintain control. And that's what tires my hand out. I am consciously assessing all the time here how this is working. And again, because of the shape of this grip, even though it's a little thinner than I would normally like on a knife, all I have to remind myself is don't hold it so hard. Just loosen up a little bit. I am not going to lose control of it because of that shape. It's going to stay at my hand. And if I loosen up a little bit, then my hand won't feel like it's tiring out. A 
By the way, if you're not into feather sticking, and I really haven't had a huge need to it. I mean, I've got, I'm in a forest full of birch trees. Birch bark laying literally at my feet right here. Feather sticking is not something that I spent a lot of time on because I'm just spoiled with all the birch bark. But the more you do of it, the more cathartic it is. It is just therapeutic. I think my friend Wade at Woods Walker 1965 will agree with me. He, that guy's a master. He really is. But it's just, just to sit here and make feathers, it has a functional, practical side to it, of course, getting practice like this for when you have to make feathers. But it's also just very, very relaxing. Okay, what else am I going to do with a knife for bushcraft? Well, of course, you have to do some scraping with it. It has to have a 90 degree angle, right? Well, maybe, but this one does for sure. So much so, I can actually feel the burr on the edge of the knife. So let's do a little fat wood scraping and light it up with the ferrocerium rod. All right, I chose fat wood scraping because it's just representative of the type of scraping we do with our knives. It could be scraping bark, it could be creating fuzz on the stick like the feather stick I just uh, created in order to get some even finer curls that you can light with the ferrocerium rod. But everybody does love seeing fat wood lit up. I do too, no, uh, no question about it. This piece is getting a little thin, but I think we can create some fuzz off of this. As long as the wind doesn't blow it away on me. Oh, that always so, smells so good. I think that's the reason I like using fat wood is because of the smells. I need to, time to start looking for some new pieces of fat wood. This is something I found locally and I'm just uh, starting to run short of it. So. Doesn't seem to be as popular here as in other places. So of course, if I was looking to make a fire with fat wood as my initial kindling, I would certainly do a lot more than that. A combination of the fuzz created by the back of the blade, as well as some shavings off of it. One thing about fat wood is it does gum up the back of your knife. See if I can not lose this. There, that's better. Give it enough of a strike. So, does it uh, strike a ferrocerium rod? Very well. Does it scrape fat wood? Very well. If it'll do those, it'll scrape all types of wood. Okay, let's wrap this video up. All right, let's have a few closing thoughts on the Forester from Work Tough Gear designed by Alex at Aurora Borealis Knives. I'd like to thank Alex and Vic for sending me this knife so that I ha could have the honor of testing it and reviewing it. I mentioned a minute ago, I haven't had it all that long. This is only its third trip to the woods, so it's not a long-term review, but I've had it long enough to put it through its paces. I really did so. You, well, it probably shows on the edge of the blade of the knife. I have not cleaned this up since I have received it. I have not sharpened it at all. Actually, after the first night or first full day of use, I took it home, did a paper cut test, and it just, I could not find anything wrong with the edge at all. I still can't. There's still absolutely nothing wrong with that edge. So I think that speaks well of the steel choice as well as the heat treatment for the knife as well as the design. The fact that it has that micro bevel, that polished micro convex bevel, I can barely see that. If it wasn't for the glint of light off it, you would, wouldn't even know it's there. But it's there enough to protect the edge from rolling or chipping out. Great materials, great design. Look at the point on this. I mentioned that a minute ago. It's not a true spear point, but it does come to a very fine point with some belly. And although I didn't demonstrate this, I did some carving as if I was spoon carving because uh, yes, I have carving knives, but what I like uh, to be able to do is make something on the spot. And actually I've had to do that when I forgot a spoon in the past. So to be able to fashion something very quickly with your knife is a task that you wanted to be able to do. And I have found that I can with this. 
because this still has the fine enough tip for getting into small curls and small spaces as if you were making a spoon or any other type of wood carving for that matter. It's a, it's a very relaxing knife to use. Maybe that's a good way of describing it. It does have some weight to it. That was one of the things I picked it up and said, it's not like my Pucos. It has some weight to it, but of course it is a full tang design. So that's definitely going to add weight to it. And I asked Alex about it, the weight of it. And of course the the G10 does add to the weight as well, but it is not skeletonized in the handle itself, and that's done for a purpose. It's intentionally weighted towards the handle. And when he said that, I, I oh yeah, of course, the reason for that is it makes it feel like it's faster on the front end. When you've got a heavier handle than you do a blade, it is much faster and easier to manipulate in your hand. And this definitely fills the bill. A little heavier than a, say, a true Puko design, but uh, it's not, right? This is a work tough gear special, uh, a purpose built bushcraft knife. I don't think they have any other. I think this may be their first purpose built per bushcraft knife. They've knocked it out of the park on this one. Love it. Love it, Alex. Love it, Vic. Thank you very much. This is going to be going out with me a lot. No question about it. Okay. If you have any questions or any comments on the Forester, or anything else for that matter, please put them in the comment section below. Uh, I will, of course, be putting the links as well as all the specs and information for this knife in the video description. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.